um, for people that that will uh, see this as a recorded version uh, they will see that survey link um, and they'll be able to access it even from the recorded version but um, I can look at the timestamp for when they access the database and, and at least for the Society of American Foresters um, they do not uh, accept credits for um, a non-live viewing of this presentation. So, so use that if you're a certified forester, licensed forester, master naturalist, uh, whatever, um, please use that hot link. And that will be disappearing uh, when we start the presentation. Um, in, the, in the bottom, in the lower right-hand quadrant, you'll see chat pod number four. Um, our speaker, Dr. Andrew Leibold, has uh, inserted several websites related to gypsy moths, and those are accessible for you. And those, again, will also be accessible if you come back and watch the recorded version of this. You will be able to click on those hot links. So um, you can click on them now. They should all open on the, on the background screen. Of your computer, they sh they shouldn't interfere with this presentation, but those also will be disappearing here in in uh, two or three minutes when we get started. So, and I'm assuming everyone can hear me okay. Caitlin can, Bob Stanley can. Okay, James and Ron, good. Sandy, do you want to turn your microphone on and just do a quick hello? Good morning. Hey, Peter, I just turned it on. Great. So, hi, everyone. Great. Can everyone hear Sandy? This is Sandy. Sounds like it works. Good. Amazing, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Explain how this works for me someday. Yeah, right. No, I won't. <laughs> So you can't. That sounds yes, like I'm loud. Sandy, you can go back to the advanced settings and turn your microphone down. Try it down on like a 50 or a 55. So go to the meeting, meeting, oh, meeting really? menu so, and then audio setup. And then click all the way through to you get to the end and you have the option for advanced settings and then set your microphone level at 50 to 55. For the participants, you can oh. go ahead, Sandy. Yeah, I just set it down to 48. Is this That's, better? Yes. Well, I think it is. For those of you that thought that was uh, <laughs> loud before, there's Tim. Hi, Tim. So you can also um, adjust the volume on your speakers. When we when I introduce. Uh, Sandy here in just a minute. I will stop talking, and so there will be a single speaker, a uh, single presenter, and you can adjust the volume on your on your personal computer or headset or whatever you're using to um, at whatever a comfortable level is. Okay, I've got about a minute till the clock says zero, but that timer pod clock is notoriously inaccurate. Um, so just a, a quick reminder for those of you who are interested in a certificate of participation, use the hot link in the left center portion of the screen. And for those of you who would like access to some additional websites um, related to Gypsy Mall, those are in chat pod number four in the lower right hand quadrant. Um, we can bring uh, we can bring those those pods back at the end of the presentation, or you can check the, the forestconnect.info website in the next day or so, and this will be, presentation will be, the recording will be posted online, and you can access those websites at that time as well. So, all right, well, let's, um, we're going to jump over to the main presentation screen. And I'd like to welcome everyone. My name's Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester um, based at the Cornell University campus in Ithaca. 
uh, we've been running the, the program that I manage and, and direct is the Forest Connect program. One piece of that is to run this monthly webinar series. And we've been, we've all been uh, fortunate and benefited from having access to some really good speakers, including uh, today's speaker who's coming back for a second time. And uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Sandy Leibold. He's with the U.S. Forest Service in uh, West Virginia. And I've seen Sandy's name in the scientific literature for decades dealing with about every aspect of gypsy moth ecology and management that you can imagine. So he's he's been a player in a lot of different um, aspects of this um, base of insect and uh, he's offered to come and talk with us today about the ecology and management of gypsy moths in North America. So Sandy, I'll turn the microphone over to you. Okay, Peter. Well, thanks so much. I, I really love the, the format of this uh, webinar. For me, it's like a real luxury to be able to give a talk without having to get on an airplane. So, and I think probably everyone else maybe feels the same way. So it's, it's really a great thing. Um, I'm going to be uh, so obviously, I'm, as the name would suggest, I'm going to be talking about gypsy moth, and I've been working with this insect for pretty much most of my career, which is about 25 years. And um, it's amazing. It's a very well-studied insect. There are probably hundreds of people who have, who have uh, done research uh, with this insect over the last uh, several decades. So um, it, it, I, I think because so much is known about it, it actually makes a nice model system. And of course, a lot of people I have to admit, I actually like the gypsy moth, <laughs> but I think most people would probably not like it. So, and I can understand that because there's a lot not to like about it. But, um, oh, one thing I was going to mention, um, you know, if in you, those of you who participated before, you know, you can type in uh, questions over there in that chat um, pod, and I, I, I'll try to keep an eye on them, um, and maybe I can address some of the questions as they come up. Um, or I may, I do have actually have a lot of slides I'm going to work through, so I may save some of them to the end. Uh, and then also, you, you feel free to contact me by, by uh, email. You can just Google my name, and I have, you know, have lots of web pages plastered over the internet with my email address, so feel free to send me an email. Okay, so we're going to move along. And the, the gypsy moth, uh, as probably most of you know, is not native to North America, it's native to most of temperate. Um, Eurasia and Northern Africa, and is thus an example of a, uh, a biological invasion. Um, in contrast to a lot of invasive species, the, the gypsy moth is um, it, it's, a, a, it's a pest in its um, uh, native range. That is, that uh, it, it causes problems uh, where it's you know has evolved for, for thousands of millions of years. Because um, that's not the case with a lot of insects. Say, for example, emerald ash borer, which really is not a problem in its native Asia, but is here. And, and so, the gypsy moth is an example of something that's it, it's a problem in both at its exotic and native range. Um, I actually have this little collection you can see of names uh, from gypsy moth around the world. My favorite is is actually this one. The uh, the uh, let's see, the uh, nun with a big head, which is the name of the gypsy moth in Slovak. So. Um, so, and again, gypsy moth being just an, an, an example of a much larger problem, which is this continual flow of, of exotic species into North America. Um, and this is something that probably many of you know is particularly a problem here in the Northeast, that we have, this is a map showing the number of non-native forest pests, and we have, this is from my, from my last seminar with Peter, and, uh, just it's it's a pretty map, and I thought I'd show it just to show again an example of the, the larger problem. So I'm going to jump in just with a little bit of biology of the gypsy moth. And one of the most important things that, and maybe some of you may have familiar with a little bit with the gypsy moth, that even though we do the gypsy moth is considered a single species, Lymantria dispar, um, but within its its range there are kind of two uh, strains of the gypsy moth that are recognized: the the Asian strain um, and the uh, European strain. Nor the North American populations that we have um, originate from Europe. Um, and the, the, probably the biggest difference in their biology is, is the European strains, most of the females are incapable of flight. And in the Asian strains, most of the females are, are capable of flight. Um, and so that means that the ones we have here in North America are incapable of flight. It, it turns out that this thing is not strictly just an Asia or non-Asia thing. In fact, you'll find there are some places in Europe, especially here in this overlap region, 
used to refer to the Asian Gypsy Moth as a flight capable, but there is this tendency, and I thought I'd just mention that. Um, so just moving ahead with the life history, the, so the adults, um, uh, Gypsy Moths mate in the um, uh, maybe mid to late summer, and um, right after mating, the um, female lays her, all of her eggs on, in a single mass covered with these uh, spiny hairs. Uh, usually the egg masses are, are laid on the, on the trunk of the tree, but they can be on branches, things, objects on the ground. Um, and so then um, the, they spend the entire winter in the egg stage, um, and then in the spring, anywhere from like 300 to 800. Um, so they have a, a very good uh, capability of, of population growth because of the large uh, fecundity. So the larvae immediately is actually done since the adults actually don't feed at all. Um, and one thing I should point out is the, the once the larvae get to be large, they, they actually just, in most populations, they just feed at night and, and then come down um, out of the canopy and seek cryptic resting sites like in bark crevices or even in the forest floor. We don't really know why they do this completely, but we, we tend to think that they're somehow trying to avoid uh, predators or parasites by doing this, uh, only feeding at night. Um, and so the, then usually by uh, midsummer, the um, the, the larvae go through their final um, larval molt and they enter the pupal stage, which is you know the resting stage between the larva and the adult. And they, they tend to pupate the same location where the larvae rest. Um, that um, um, that they uh, these so it's typically on tree trunks you, you would see the pupae. In the pupal stage, it only lasts um, maybe um, a, a week or ten days or so. So um, the gypsy moth, he, even here in North America, there are many different um, uh, natural enemies. Um, and uh, one group of natural enemies are what we refer to as parasitoid. A parasitoid is a, a, refers to another insect that uh, it, it's, it's a parasite. Most of these, the, the adult, they're either flies or wasps. and They lay their eggs either on the outside or the inside of a, of a larva or a pupa. And then the, they lay their eggs in there and the eggs hatch and basically turn into a maggot that eats the inside of the uh, gypsy moth. It's sort of like, I always thought it would be a good subject for a science fiction movie because it's, it's kind of gross. You can be watching a larva and all of a sudden this maggot comes crawling out of it. But it, it's very common. Pretty much all uh, 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 moths and butterflies have these things. And, and the gypsy moth, most of these are not native to North America. They were actually introduced to the turn of the century in an effort to to control the, the uh, gypsy moth populations via biological control. And we don't, we, we think that they do contribute some control, but they obviously are not totally successful in eliminating outbreaks. Um, the other group of natural enemies, that's, the next one that's important are the pathogens. And in virtually every gypsy moth population in, in the world, um, there's a, uh, what's it called, a nucleopolyhedrosis virus. It's a virus that's specific only to the gypsy moth. And uh, it, um, uh, it, it usually causes the collapse of high density populations at when, you know when populations reach outbreak levels eventually this virus catches up with them and you find larvae wilting on the trunks of trees um, in the last uh, 15 years almost there's a, a fungus which I'll mention more a little bit later has come on the scene and it it has a rather similar behavior that causes sort of a wilting disease uh, symptoms in the larvae and kills them um, so uh, the, the final group of, of natural enemies I was going to mention are, are predators. And uh, most of these are what we call generalist predators, which means they feed on uh, many different species, not just gypsy moths. And, and we know that birds will prey on gypsy moths, but they're not really a preferred food item for, for birds. And, and some invertebrates like uh, ants and, and predaceous beetles. But we there's no question the most important per predators, and in fact, probably the most important natural enemy at low densities are small mammals. These are deer mice and uh, shrews, and we know that they're capable of eating uh, many thousands of gypsy moth larvae. And um, even though they don't pref necessarily prefer gypsy moths, when po gypsy moth populations are at low densities, they, they are probably the most important gypsy moth predator. Um, 
So uh, in terms of, of uh, gypsy moth hosts, um, again, gypsy moth larvae feed on foliage, and there we refer to them as a polyphagous host or polyphagous, meaning that they have they will feed on species, many different species of um, of trees, and um, even though they they are polyphagous, there are certain species that they prefer. And in North America, oaks are are by far the most uh, common. Uh, preferred species, but there there are other species such as a, uh, apple, aspen, and other species that gypsy moth larvae do quite well on. Um, it, it, there are some, another group of species that are not necessarily we don't call them preferred, and it, it's a little tricky to, to kind of define gypsy moth foliage preference because the 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 very young larvae tend to be more picky than the old larvae. Um, that is, the, the, the young larvae will pretty much only feed on these preferred species like oak, et cetera. Whereas the, when the larvae get to be large, they can feed on a much larger variety of, of species. So for example, eastern hemlock uh, and some spruces can be fed, or white pine are fed on, um, and, and it just wants to do quite lar well on them in the late end stars. And in fact, during outbreaks, you may sometimes feed, see a site like this, which is hemlock that's been completely defoliated, in contrast to uh, most deciduous trees can tolerate getting defoliated once because they'll refoliate. That a, a conif most conifers cannot tolerate defoliation; will die immediately. Um, so, it, it, I was going to mention just sort of in addition to the, the species of trees that gypsy moth, uh, where you tend to see gypsy moth outbreaks, the the the, the types or, or associations of species that we most commonly see gypsy moth outbreaks in are, of course, in North America, the ones that are dominated by oak. So these would be oak hickory. Oak pine stands seem to be particularly susceptible to gypsy moth outbreaks uh, because these are drier sites, and gypsy moth seems to do really well on ridge tops. This is something we don't completely understand. Um, and then, of course, in more northern latitudes, uh, aspen, um, is some, is, you get pure stands of aspen, and you can actually get gypsy moth outbreaks developing there. As well, but one of the things is sort of a rule of thumb that we find that you really won't get a, a gypsy moth outbreak developing unless you have at least 20% of the basal area um, composed of of the preferred species like oaks and, and aspen and that sort of thing. Um, so, and actually, one of the I, one of the people list the participants in our our webinar today is Randy Warren, who used to work here, and he actually made this map. I'm so so proud, Randy. This is great. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is a map that shows the distribution of, of these susceptible uh, forest types um, in um, in the U.S. And one of the things that you can see is that uh, this this black line here represents where, essentially where the distribution has spread so far from the from the, its introduction site uh, up here in Boston. And you can see it really hasn't gotten to some of the really good places like the Ozarks. Uh, so there's. Uh, no doubt going to be a lot of interesting things to come. Um, so for any of you who have ever experienced gypsy moth outbreaks, I can imagine you can uh, have some interesting stories. They, they tend not to be a lot of fun. The, the, the gypsy moths can be outbreaks, uh, cause, you know, they can cause the, these impressive scenes of just, you know, mil thousands, millions of acres of defoliation in a single year. Um, this is actually a shot from a couple years ago up in central Pennsylvania. Um, and this is something. Uh, and so every year, the, the Forest Service, in conjunction with, this, with uh, the states, they do aerial surveys. And this is a, a map from 2007. And here's just the number of acres defoliated in the last few years. And you can see the populations that actually our, our biggest outbreaks uh, were in the uh, late, the early 1980s, and then the, the early 1990s. We haven't had a really big one like those periods, but. And just because populations in general have been on the little low side, but but the last few years uh, the populations have, have been up again. I, I expect next year the populations will decline in, in the east, but uh, we'll see. And and one of the things, um, in fact, one of the reasons why I say they are likely to decline is that when you look at the the time series of gypsy moth defoliation over a long time period. Uh, they tend to have this sort of boom and bust behavior. That is, there are certain peaks where they're very high, and then usually once they reach a peak, they collapse. And and they are dominated by a periodicity of about uh, 10 years. Um, although we do also know that in addition to this dominant 10-year periodicity, there's sort of this subdominant five-year periodicity. So this is, this is something where uh, people like myself, we spend a lot of time researching, you know, trying to figure out, well, what's the 
mechanism operating behind these population cycles. Um, and the population cycles are, of course, they're kind of approximate. You know, you, they're not, it's not like a sine wave. Uh, but in, in general, the, the outbreaks tend, the, the big outbreaks tend to be about 10 years apart, 9 to 10 years apart. So, and it, as I mentioned before, it, it probably will never really know for sure what really is the driving force behind the outbreaks. But our, our, our best theories these days are that it really is a, a results from a combination of two factors. One is these generous predators, which are, I mentioned before, the deer mice, and they uh, consume large numbers of, of uh, gypsy moths at low densities, but there's no real feedback. That is, if the populations go up, the, the populations of the generalist predators don't go up. Um, and then, uh, but it, at, so eventually the gypsy moths populations will reach very high densities, and then they do hit some feedback, and that's when, when populations get very high, then you get pathogens such as the virus and fungus that eventually uh, wipes the populations out and causes them to collapse. So this is essentially, uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but this is from a, a type of a simulation model that we, uh, that many of, one of many that have been used to describe general population dynamics. And so the basic idea is that at, and when the populations are, are very low, you have predation, very high levels of predation by uh, these generalist predators, but then the, the gypsy moth populations slowly build up and then eventually reach these very high levels, and at those high levels, the disease kicks in and causes the populations to crash back down to very low levels. And so that's uh, our our theory of what causes these outbreaks to cause this boom and bust, the, the dynamics to cause this boom and bust behavior. Um, and I mentioned that it, the virus, the, there's a this gypsy moth specific virus, which is thought to be the main cause then of, of sort of the this, this cyclic behavior. Um, it, but, and it, it, you'll find this virus everywhere in the world where the gypsy moth exists. Um, but the, in um, about 15 years ago, the, all of a sudden um, it was noticed there was a, a new pathogen, a, a fungus um, a pathogen, also causing killing large numbers of gypsy moth populations. So a bit of a mystery. It was actually, uh, USDA tried to introduce it back in the turn of the century in 1900, and they thought they failed. It's only, the only place in the world where it's known to exist is in Japan. And then it's, it, all of a sudden it took off and has caused large amounts of mortality. And in fact, in some of the populations, I'll, I'll just skip over that. This is some work that uh, my collaborators and I have been doing up in central Pennsylvania. And we go into some of these populations and we don't even see the levels of virus are actually quite low. And whereas the, the mortality from the fungus, it's, it's called Antimophaga mimiga, um, are, are much higher. So it almost seems in some of these populations, the, the fungus almost seems to be sort of just taking the taking over the role of the virus as, as being the, the agent that causes the collapse of populations. But to be honest, we don't really know. It's really going to take us you know, 10 or 20 years before we really understand the role of this fungus in, in gypsy moth dynamics. Um, another interesting thing that, that you, we noticed that when we look at, at gypsy moth outbreaks uh, over large areas, over large air time periods, is this phenomenon of, of spatial synchrony. And basically, this refers to this phenomenon where you, you get outbreaks occurring um, over large areas uh, in essentially in the same year. So you can see, in this case, in the New England states, uh, uh, around 1980 and again uh, around uh, 1990, there were these synchronous uh, outbreaks occurring in, in all these, these states. And again, it's a, it's a complicated thing. And, it, and again, it's a great topic for people like me that like to study uh, uh, population ecology because we'll, we'll, we'll probably could spend several careers trying to figure out what causes this, and it's a phenomenon that's actually common in a lot of a lot of different uh, animal species. And um, we tend to think with the gypsy moth that that it, it probably represents it may be the synchronization of populations may be mediated by the um, by the trophic. Essentially, it goes back to weather. That is, that you have variability in in weathers. You know, you have uh, dry years, hot years, in some ways, and and it's fair in some years and not in others, and this, the, these patterns extend over large regions, and these weather anomalies can affect both uh, directly affect popula affects the population dynamics of gypsy moths, but also affect the populations of of the small mammal predators, and and all, in addition mass seeding, because it turns out that these generous predators, these small mammals, are um, are um, their populations themselves are driven by uh, mass uh, seeding. That's right. Someone just commented that some that Rick Osfeld, who's uh, there in Millbrook, New York, has done some very nice, nice 
nice work with this. And in fact, actually related the, uh, <coughs> the, the, the story is even a little more complex because these small, small mammal populations themselves are also involved in, in the dynamics of Lyme disease. So it's a very complex uh, thing. Um, so the consequences of, of gypsy mouth outbreaks, um, again, they're, they're really spectacular things uh, when you see them. Um, uh, and the, the, the consequences can become rather complex. And one of the things that, that can happen is, is tree mortality, is trees dying. Usually, I would say basically the main take-home message on, on tree mortality is, is that usually you, the mortality for most gypsy moth outbreaks is, is not that extensive. Unfortunately, there are a few exceptions where you can get catastrophic mortality. That is where you're getting you know, greater than 95% of the basal area being killed. And these tend to happen in, in pure oak stands. Um, and again, it's the exception rather than the rule, but it does happen. Um, and when gypsy moth does kill a tree, it usually doesn't kill trees by themselves. Um, they're actually, all the gypsy moth really does is it weakens the tree, which then allows um, secondary agents to colonize the trees, one of those being armillaria root rot, which is a fungal pathogen which colonizes the roots of, of uh, oaks and eventually uh, causes the shutdown of, of, of movement uh, in, in the xylem. Um, the other is uh, an insect, the, the two-lined chestnut borer. Um, and the, actually, the, for those of you who are familiar with the, the emerald ash borer, this is actually in the same genus as the emerald ash borer. So, but it's native to North America. And um, it, it's not as, as aggressive as the emerald ash borer, but in some ways it's similar. It's basically what happens when you get a gypsy moth outbreak, you get large numbers of these, these uh, two-lined chestnut borers, their populations build up and um, uh, and then they reach pretty high levels for sometimes for if you have a lot of stressed trees their populations can reach pretty high levels and so you you can actually have the these insects starting to move on to, to even to some of the fairly healthy trees um, and and so it probably sort of amplifies some of the mortality uh, caused by um, uh, by gypsy moth um, so but but this is actually just the results of a single study I just have it here just to point out the fact that usually the percent mortality is rather low, especially if you only have one year of, of if you just have one year of defoliation, you might expect you know less than 10% of the basal area to die. And even with 2%, you may only expect a little bit more. Um, what very often is very critical is whether you have other factors, like say if there's a, a drought. And, and there are very few cases where, where there have been a, a a single year of, of defoliation coinciding with a year of intense drought. And in those situations, you get really extensive mortality. But that's, again, that's the exception rather than the rule. Um, the other thing that you see um, is the trees that usually die are the trees that are going to die anyway. That is, in most stands, the trees that die following a single year of defoliation tend to be uh, the trees in, with poor crown condition, and, and or are suppressed. And so those, you may actually have very high levels of mortality. But the trees that are in good, good health uh, are much less likely to die. Um, and, and so what really this results in is, is you know, the, during a gypsy moth outbreak, in most stands, you would find that the, the trees that are going to die are the ones that maybe would have died sometime in the next 10 years anyway. Um, um, but because of that, there have been, you will sometimes see some uh, either salvage or, um, and there are some guidelines available for, for sort of pre-salvage thinning to basically remove the, the, these trees that are most likely to die before uh, a gypsy moth outbreak if that's anticipated. Um, so in terms of the, the sort of regional impacts, there aren't really too many studies available, but um, one of them that was done uh, by uh, Dave Ganser back um, several years ago where he took some uh, forest inventory analysis data from the, the Pocono Mountains. And this is an area that, that received uh, quite a bit of defoliation um, over a 10-year period. And he looked at the cha overall changes in, in, um, uh, in oak volume between two consecutive uh, inventories over a 10-year period. And actually, he saw that for most of the oaks, the actual amount of volume actually increased. Uh, even though, and so this is even though there was more, there was no doubt there was a lot of mortality happening in these stands. But the main thing that was driving this increase in mortality, uh, increase in volume, is that the surviving trees are getting bigger, and um, and you also even get uh, uh, smaller trees that are reaching merchantable ages. So, um, so on, on a regional scale, it's very often 
difficult to say that that juicing off deflation really significantly impacts the the overall yield of of, of uh, oak or other uh, species volume. Um, so probably a bigger question is well, what is the effect on on the uh, sort of next generation of trees? And when you look in regenerate in stands where there has been heavy defoliation and or heavy mortality, this is, again this is just a single study that was um, done in central Pennsylvania. And of course, the, what you see most of regeneration is good old red maple. Um, but and in the in the drier sites, there you are getting a little bit of oak regeneration, but in the wetter sites, very very little. And of course, for probably most of your those of you are familiar with oak silviculture, probably realize that the, the overall problem here isn't necessarily gypsy moth that's causing this regional decline in, in oak regeneration, but it's probably other things such as uh, 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 grazing by uh, white-tailed deer. And and if anything, the gypsy moth defoliation may basically just sort of speed along a, a sort of success, successional trend that's already in, in process, process, which is, you know, basically the conversion of these oak-dominated stands, uh, basically converting to uh, to not, either non-oak stands in the more mesic sites or or in the more xeric sites to have stands that continue to have some oak, but, but perhaps mixed with more of other species. So, um, the gypsy moth probably sp speeds this process along, but it, it, it's not really the root cause of it. So in addition to effects on, on things like volume, uh, timber resources, the, I have to be honest, probably the, that the timber impacts are probably not the, the main impact of the gypsy moth. I, I would say the main impact is uh, on uh, homeowners, that uh, there, it just is sort of a, a thing about the gypsy moth is that it has these characteristics such as during outbreaks you can get large numbers, these are gypsy moth caterpillars crawling over this building or large numbers of cadavers on picnic tables. So people just don't like gypsy moths and they don't like having their trees in front of their houses uh, defoliated. Um, there, there are a few other things, I mean for example um, water quality in, in watersheds um, 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 uh, and um, and there are a few cases where municipal water uh, water departments have had to had to uh, recommend boiling of water during an extensive gypsy moth outbreak because what ha one of the things that happens has been shown is that is that when you get extensive defoliation you get a huge uh, f uh, flush of of nitrate nitrogen going into the stream water and this in some cases can cause uh, the coliform bacteria to bloom in reservoirs, and this this could be a bit of a of a problem. Um, so, um, but the main uh, impetus is really probably homeowners and people, especially you know people who live in forested residential area, not liking the defoliation, and so consequently, this brings us into the management side of things. Um, and and then the, I'm really going to be mentioning kind of three types of gypsy moth management. Um, we refer to as uh, suppression. Uh, to eradication and slow spread and suppression, which I'm going to talk about first, really refers to trying to reduce populations when you have an outbreak, trying to prevent defoliation. And um, this is usually done because it usually involves treating large areas. It, the really only practical way to do this is with the aerial application of pesticides. Um, and so over the years, um, the amount of of area that's where the Forest Service, I think I have another slide after that talks about the Forest Service has a what's called the Cooperative Suppression Program. Um, and if you look at the acres sprayed over the years, one of the things that, what well, the first thing that jumps out is the, the, the overall trends in, in from year to year sort of track the, the, per, the cyclicity and the gypsy moth populations. So basically during the, the boom years in, in gypsy moth uh, populations, that's when they do the most spraying, which is not very surprising. Um, the other thing, though, is you can see there's really been a, a big shift in terms of what sprayed. And back in the in the in the good old days, most of the spraying was done with materials like seven, um, with chemical pesticides. And but what's happened is over the years there's been a shift more and more, all, and to the point of now almost all the treatment aerial suppression that's done um, is done for for suppression is done using what we call BT, which stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. And, Many of you are probably familiar with it. It's a it's a, a wide spectrum bacterial uh, pesticide that kills uh, many different Lepidoptera species. And but it, it's a very innocuous material. And um, in fact, it's actually certified for use uh, on organic crops because it, it's such a benign material. Um, but um, 
Yeah, so the Forest Service actually operates through so the Forest Service uh, State and Private Forestry has a program they refer to as the Cooperative Suppression Program, which they carried out usually with with each state. And basically, and the details tend to vary from state to state in terms of the cost sharing. The, in all cases, the Forest Service provides 50% of the funding for uh, aerial suppression of, of gypsy moss outbreaks. Um, in, in states like Pennsylvania, the, the um, the um, uh, the state then kicks in, I think, 25%, and the landowner kicks in 25%. In, in West Virginia, I believe, the state doesn't kick in anything, so the landowner has to pay the other 50%. But it's basically a way that the Forest Service sort of subsidizes uh, 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 aerial uh, suppression of gypsy moth outbreaks. Um, and so in, in these types of programs, uh, usually the decision of whether to treat or not is based on the number of egg masses during the winter. So if you go out, um, so th because again, remember the, the, they spend all winter in the, this egg stage, so it's a convenient way to, to, to census populations. And so usually we do this in what's called a fixed radius plot where we put in these circular plots and, and people go out into these plots. Uh, so you put several of these in, your, in a stand and each of those plots, people go out and, and um, count uh, egg masses either way up high on the tree or lower down on the trunks of trees, and based on the on the on the actual egg mass density, we can then uh, provide some sort of prediction of of defoliation levels. Now, one of the things when you look at this relationship, it's a pretty fuzzy relationship. That is, you can actually have a high gypsy moth density and not get defoliation, uh, and so it, it, it's a pr the, the the whole process of aerial suppre of suppressing gypsy moth outbreaks really it's a problematic thing it's it, it's it's very difficult to predict defoliation um, it's also difficult even using this BT it turns out with these suppression programs there's a lot of trouble with with weather if it's raining the BT doesn't really work well and if the timing is off so it's a problematic thing but but you know people don't like to be in a defoliated area and so there continues to be a lot of demand for these suppression programs. Um, I'm going to, uh, in the rest of my talk, I'm going to kind of shift gears and talk a little bit more about the invasion biology of, of gypsy moth. Um, and again, with all biological invasions, I think I mentioned this in my other talk for those of you who are there, we really usually recognize three phases, the arrival, establishment, and spread of, of an invading population. And so with the arrival, arrival basically refers to the, basically the you know, process by which the organism is transported to a new area, such as a new continent. Um, um, Oh yeah, someone asked about predators of the egg mass. Well, maybe I might save that question to the end because uh, it's an interesting question. Um, so, um, the, in, in the case of the gypsy moth, we know that it arrived um, in near Boston in the town of Medford um, in 1868 or 1869. And and actually, in contrast to a lot of alien species, most of the alien species, we really don't know how they got there. We may have a vague idea of where they showed up first. And, we might have a guess how they got there. In the case of gypsy moth, it's a rather nice thing because we know exactly whose fault it is. And it's actually this guy, uh, Truvalo, who was a, actually he was an amateur, he was a professional artist, uh, but an amateur entomologist. And he lived in this house in, in Medford, Massachusetts. And as a hobby, he liked to play with bugs. And, and he apparently, he was native of France, apparently brought some uh, back with him from France and, and was cultivating them in his backyard. And they got loose. To give him credit, he did actually notify the authorities about this problem, but nobody really cared until about 15 years, 15, 20 years later when the first outbreak appeared in his backyard. And, and five or 10 years later, the government basically realized they really should do something about this. And so they mounted a large-scale eradication program. These photos, uh, they're very cool, I think, are showing you know large, these crews of people that were sent out there to scrape egg masses out of trees. And it was a very gallant effort. Uh, but you know the problem was they had pretty crude tools such as you know burning for infested forests and so they ultimately failed um, to eradicate the populations and so by uh, 1900 the gypsy moth is established in this uh, uh, area around around Boston and then basically since then it's basically just been gradually expanding its range um, now people have been interested in 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 monitoring the spread of the gypsy moth, and in fact, interested in trying to to stop its spread for many years, there's actually a program that kind of started on again, off again from um, 
like 1915 until about 1960, which was a barrier zone that was located along this, uh, mostly located along the Hudson River Valley. Um, and they used uh, very primitive pheromone traps even back then. They knew they put a, a female in a, um, in a trap like this with sticky panels. They could, it was a very sensitive method for detecting populations. We use, still use these uh, pheromone traps, although now we use a, a synthetic uh, f uh, version of the pheromone rather than using a live female. Um, but So there was this large barrier zone along the Hudson River Valley. Um, and during that program, it, it kind of morphed into different phases. They and in the um, uh, in the 1950s, they started when um, you basically had two things: you had the discovery of DDT um, and the, the the modernization of uh, aviation. And someone basically discovered you could spray DDT out of an airplane, and and consequently you could spray large areas. And so they used this as part of this barrier zone effort. But eventually there was a lot of opposition. For those of you who have read um, um, uh, 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 Silent Spring, you know, the famous book by Rachel Carson, there's a whole chapter in there about uh, the use of DDT for gypsy moth control. This is mostly from this barrier zone project. And eventually, by 1960, early 60s, there was so much public opposition to the aerial spraying of DDT that this was stopped. Um, and so since then, uh, the gypsy moth really continued to expand its range. Um, it, the, when you look at this, the only sort of noteworthy thing here is that uh, in Michigan, there was an outlier population that became established uh, in the er, or mid-1960s. And it was probably the only case where a isolated gypsy moth, they basically failed to eradicate it. They, and that's, I, and you're interested in the details and why that failure happened, I can tell you. but. Uh, basically, it failed to eradicate, and actually now, the, the, both this main uh, population, the Michigan population, they've merged. So we basically have one big population that continues to expand its range. The fact that they they expand their range so slowly really can be attributed to the fact that the females don't fly, uh, and um, uh, and it, so several years ago, we actually did an analysis of the historical spread and basically saw that. In the early part of the 1900s, we were seeing spread around 10 kilometers per year. In from 1965 to 1990 or so, we had a spread around 21 kilometers. But this period from 1916 to 65, we had a rather slow rate of spread around three kilometers per year. And we feel that the reason for this is probably because of these barrier zones. The the barrier zone efforts they they ultimately failed. The gypsy moth continued to expand its range, but it apparently slowed its spread. Um, now, one of the things. Uh, the, the gypsy moth has this nasty habit of very often, because the, the caterpillars crawl out of the trees during the day, as I think I mentioned before, to seek resting spots, they very often come in contact with, with human humans and their possessions. So like vehicles, it's not uncommon to find egg masses on the underside of a vehicle that's parked in an outbreak area. And consequently, every year we have pop, uh, life stages that are transported out to places like California. and um, but every year, the USDA and state governments put out um, over 100,000 traps in these uninfested states. And these traps are really sensitive, a very sensitive tool for finding these isolated populations. And so this basically brings up the, the sort of second type of gypsy health management, which is detection and eradication. So the traps are used to find um, new isolated populations in places like California, and then um, when they find a population, you know, indicated by a positive trap capture, they go in and, and spray it in the following year. These days, most of the treatments in these ice in uh, places like California, more distant areas, are with Bacillus thuringiensis, the bacterial pesticide. And again, as I mentioned before, virtually every one of them, with the exception of the the, uh, the Michigan population, has been successful. And I, I, I don't actually have the data. I think they're on average over the last 20 years, we've probably seen there maybe or probably there have probably been 40 or so uh, eradication, 40 or 50 eradication programs. So it's a pretty big thing. So um, so the final thing I'm going to mention is the Slow the Spread project. And and I mentioned this is one of the things that this all these barrier zones were, were ineffective um, at, at slowing gypsy moth spread. Um, but we do think that they did serve to slow, slow the spread. And so there's been renewed interest in this about uh, 15, 20 years ago. And out of this interest uh, came a new strategy for slowing the spread of the gypsy moth. And it was really based on 
on something that a uh, rather basic thing about the way we know that the gypsy moth spreads. And this is actually common to probably a lot of invading species. That is, the way, when the gypsy moth expands its range, it, it doesn't just gradually expand. But instead, you have populations where you have populations essentially sort of jumping ahead and forming what we call isolated colonies. And the, the mechanism here is, I think I mentioned before, we know that, that things like uh, uh, recreational vehicles and, and movement of, of, of logs and things like this are, are ways that gypsy moths are accidentally moved. And this is the way we think that these isolated colonies are founded. Um, now, many of these populations get founded way, you know, long distances like California, but, but it's, it happens at an even higher frequency as you get closer to this, to this infested front. And so the whole effort, the whole slow spread program focuses on trying to find these isolated colonies because the idea is that, that, that the and models show that if you, can, if you can find and nuke these isolated colonies, it will greatly slow the, the rate of spread uh, of the gypsy moth. And so the way we find them is using grids of pheromone traps. Um, and, and basically these traps are, are deployed in a 100 kilometer band that extends all the way from the Canadian border to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and it's just, we refer to this as the Gypsy Moth Slow the Spread Program, or STS. And the whole logic behind the STS program is, because uh, some people, I've heard, you know, I told this to some people, and they say, well, why don't you just let Gypsy Moth get everywhere and get it over with? You know, it'll be, then you won't have to worry about it. But the problem is, is that Gypsy Moth outbreaks, when, when it's Gypsy Moth is established in an area, it just doesn't arrive there and then you know, you have one outbreak and that's it. What happens is it arrives there and then you then have recurring outbreaks essentially forever. Um, and, and so the, the way I sort of view the logic, so the, basically the benefit of having a solar spread program is you're, you're delaying the, the year at which the gypsy moths will establish in your area. So I sort of say the analogy of, you know, if I were to, if someone were to, to ask me whether I would like to have, you know, I was going to have Alzheimer's disease and that I was going to, I could, you know, I might have it either five years from now or I could have it 15 years from now. When when would you rather have it and how much would you like to pay to prevent it? And I'd be willing to pay quite a bit to postpone the date. So, and, and so it's basically this idea that postponing it has value is the, basically the logic behind it. And, and so the, 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 the biology um, here is, again, these grids of uh, pheromone traps are put on at a two-kilometer um, Grid. Oh yeah, someone asked about temperature extremes. It's true that that to the far north, the very farther northern areas, especially as you get into Canada, uh, two things happen. One is you get very cold temperatures that limit the population growth of gypsy moth. The other thing is you start to run out of hosts. I mean, you do have aspen, which is a good host, but you do get into, say, coniferous forests, which are not good hosts. But really, the main thing that limits gypsy moth spread and limits the development of outbreaks in northern areas is, is these really cold, overwintering temperatures, which the egg masses just can't tolerate. Um, yeah, again, so with the solar spread program, you have these grids of traps that are put out and every year. And then when when the traps indicate the, uh, the existence of an isolated population, more traps are put in to delimit the, the spatial extent of the population. And then finally, um, the, er the, the area is, is treated um, to, to retard the growth of the isolated population. Actually, it doesn't show it. Usually, in the, the following year, it's then monitored with more traps again to see if the treatment worked. Um, and the Just the, the Solar Spread Program has been in place for um, as a national program all the, along the extent entire expanding population front since 1999. Um, and in the, big, in the earlier years, most of the treatments were done with BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. But now, in the last five to 10 years, most of the treatments have been done using mating disruption. Because this is something that, you know, BT does have a negative impact on things like, uh, potentially negative impact on, say, for example, endangered butterflies, which sometimes is a matter of concern. Whereas mating disruption has essentially no known effects on anything other than gypsy moth. And basically the way it works is these, these tiny uh, plastic flakes are, are sprayed from an airplane. Uh, they have a little sticker, so they stick to leaves. And, and then the, you basically create this huge cloud of the synthetic pheromone, which then interrupts the ability of males to find females, and, and the population is essentially go extinct. Um, it's a rather amazing program, though, that um, uh, the Forest Service, it's, the funding for it comes entirely from the Forest Service. They, 
spend about $10 million a year. The, the funds go to the states along the expanding population front who actually carry out the work. And so about half the effort actually goes into actually placing traps. Over 100,000 of these pheromone traps are placed along this expanded, expanding population front in this 100-kilometer band. Um, and uh, so each in this, this, I don't know how well it shows up, but each dot here represents one trap. And so basically all the data is actually fed into handheld GPSs, so it's geo-referenced, and then goes into a central GIS, which is then used to, to generate maps and identify areas that, that, that should be, um, that should be um, treated. The, oh, the question was how species-specific is mating disruption? It's compl with, in the case of gypsum we don't know of any other uh, I insect that has, that, that's affected by the, that pheromone. These pheromones tend to be quite specific. In some cases, in some other families of insects, there may be some slight cross attraction, but it's quite unusual. So I would say it's, it's pretty much completely species specific. So it's, it's pretty neat stuff. Um, and so actually, the, um, the, with the Slow the Spread program, um, the, we, we've, for our, our historical analyses, indicated that gypsy moths was spreading at about 21 kilometers per year. And then the, once there's actually a predecessor program called AIPM, which was started in the uh, late 1980s, early 90s. And since the, and then that basically morphed into the slow spread program. And since that program has been in effect, it looks like we've been able to reduce spread by by more than 50 percent, which. Um, and economists tell us that that has lots of value for people who live in like places like the Ozarks. Uh, they're really the people that are benefiting from from this kind of program. So, and I think that's actually the last slide I have, Peter. So that coming up to right around 45, 50 minutes. Yeah. Mark. So I guess that's perfect. So, I, um, so do we want to? I guess people can type in questions. Yes. More questions let's so uh, maybe we'll have uh, everybody can start typing in questions, and I'm gonna. Um, rearrange the screen a little bit here so we can see the questions better wow. and let's do this oh someone I do notice someone asked a question about so because I mentioned about Zer gypsy mouth outbreaks tend to be most frequent in these Zarek stands and and yes it, it really reflects both um, you know because it, it really, it seems to be soil moisture, so it can be. It's affected both by, um, you know, the, just the geographical things like, you know, rain shadows, but and slope and aspect, and and definitely soils as well. Very again, this is one of the reasons I think with ridge tops, very often you have these. Uh, we, you know, you have, tend to have these dry, sandy soils where you get these oak pine stands growing, and that seems to be where populations thrive. And in fact, my pet theory is why the, the outbreaks tend to be so common there is, I mean, of course, one is that's the kind of places where you see oak, oaks dominating. But the other thing is the small mammal populations tend to be lower. And these are the predators, again, that kind of keep gypsy moth populations in check during low density years. So if you have fewer small mammals, then they're probably more prone to, to grow to outbreak levels. So. Um, so someone asked a question about how useful is it destroying egg masses in the winter. Um, you know, it really depends. I would say um, on if you have an open-grown tree, because again, you know, the, the gypsy moths, they can't, the only way they can move away, around between trees is by the, the, uh, the caterpillars either blowing in the wind, as very young caterpillars. The young caterpillars, after they've hatched, they spin down on silk and they blow in the wind. So if two trees are very close together, uh, it kind of, or say if you have a, a tree that, that's right next to a continuous forest with, with lots of gypsy moth populations, it's probably kind of pointless to try to remove the egg masses because the, the, you'll just get uh, you know, millions of caterpillars dispersing in from nearby um, forests. Um, but if it's an open grown tree that's quite a ways from another gypsy moth host, then I think actually removing egg masses might actually accomplish something. And, and one of the ways you can accomplish this, I mean, and a related thing that's done is the use of burlap bands. So you, that's something that people have known about since the turn of the century. If you wrap a band of burlap around a trunk of a tree that the, the caterpillars, again, they feed at night and come down, they'll find this burlap band and they, they think that it's a really fabulous place to hang out. And so you can actually, 
uh, go out there and actually pick the larvae off during the day and put them in, say, soapy water to kill them. And even if it doesn't do anything, it very often feels good. People, you know, it always feels, people, I think sometimes it's nice to feel to have some, you know, uh, some uh, equality, getting even with gypsy moths. So, uh, okay, let's see. Um, someone insists that aerial spraying somehow prolongs outbreaks, but I don't see a connection. Yeah, it probably doesn't, but, you know, there actually is, there, there, it's not a completely, um, uh, you know, again, I think that in most cases, aerial spraying doesn't prolong the outbreak, but there may actually be a few cases where it does, um, because what happens is, you know, usually the, the population will eventually, the outbreak will collapse when, when the disease, which is usually the, the virus or fungus, builds up in the population. And, and in order for that, that disease to really get cranking through the gypsy moth populations, you need to have high densities. And so if you, you know, if you reduce the density down, you may actually prevent the development of that, that um, epizootic. But I, but I think what, the reason why it doesn't really work necessarily is, again, because usually, you know, if you look at the places that are treated, no one ever has, we don't have, the, no one has the resources to treat all gypsy moth outbreaks. And in fact, if you look historically, we usually treat maybe a tenth of the, the area that gets treated is a tenth of the area that gets defoliated. So, so even if you treat one wooded area, the, the epizootic will spread in from adjoining areas. So, so I, I think in most cases, aerial spraying doesn't, doesn't prolong the outbreak. Um, so. Uh, so, okay, someone asked a question. Let's see. Sandy, let me, let me inter oh, yeah. temporarily interrupt. For all the participants, there's uh, immediately above the chat pod, you'll see a note to please complete this exit survey. If you could um, click on that link so that you can open that exit survey, it's, it's essential that we get a high percentage of, of participating, participants taking this um, exit survey so that we can document the impacts and continue to to be able to offer this. It also provides me a very nice way to give some metrics to Sandy that he can share with with um, people in the Forest Service to you know to, to demonstrate his impacts in in um, in and among foresters and landowners. So that's you're it'll take a couple of minutes, but it it it, it um, provides great mileage for us. So so please do. Um, take that exit survey. Okay, Sandy, sorry, back to you. No, that's a good idea. I have, you, it, take the exit survey. I have to send my kids to college. So, um, Let's see. <laughs> so if the females do not fly, what is the physical mechanism by which the population spread? Well, that's a good question. I mean, uh, so, and, and we, and in fact, we've done, um, the, the main natural mechanism that the gypsy moths have for for spreading or, disper with, or dispersal, the main you know natural dispersal mechanism is this uh, first instar larvae blowing in the wind. But there, it's actually a really hard thing to study. But there have been a few studies of it, and we think that in most cases, you know, 99.9999 percent of the larvae only go you know maybe less than 500 meters in a single um, in a single year, and so. Uh, if they, and in fact, our models show that if they were just spreading by this windborne dispersal of, of, of the young caterpillars, they would only be spreading about two kilometers per year. But we know they, you know, that they're, instead they're spreading, you know, anywhere between 10 to 20 or more kilometers per year. And so we know the reason why they spread so much faster is because of this artificial movement of life stages. That is people accidentally moving, um, um, Things like you know, egg masses being actually moved on automobiles, uh, you know, lawn furniture. We know household moves are the way they get around uh, wood, logs, firewood. Um, so that's probably the most important mechanism by which they, they disperse that affects spread. So, um, so let's see. So would, you, would increasing the number of snags to increase the habitat for small mammals help even on the ridgetop sites? Well, it's an interesting question. I, I, and it really comes down to um, you know, a question of what's the kind of critical thing for um, small mammal, um, uh, to, how can you affect your small mammal carrying capacity? And you know, it may be something, it's an interesting thing. And I, you know, I'm not a uh, mammologist, so I don't, probably don't have any very, very good useful, but I can still uh, speculate on that. But um, at least in some areas, in some of these oak-dominated stands, the critical thing that affects uh, 
um, um, the small mammal populations is the availability of mass because it's it, it, the small mammals depend on mass, e.g., you know, acorns to survive the winters. They cache them, um, and so of course the ironic thing is <laughs> the thing that 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 is good for the small mammal populations is to have a lot of oaks. But then of course the you get more um, the more oaks, then you know of course that's more habitat for gypsy moths. But um, so but I know we, we've done studies that you can actually if you feed um, the we've actually artificially provided food uh, for small mammals over the winter, and you can elevate the small mammal populations, and 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 also increase the mortality on gypsy moths. But none of the things like uh, there's never been any evidence that you know things like creating more cover or snags really affects the small mammal populations. I'm aware of it, but it might be an interesting thing to look into. So um, let's see. Uh, someone asks, is it um, important to trap for gypsy moths in areas with established populations, for example, upstate New York, to monitor population? Actually, that's a really good question. Um, unf I, I would say the quick answer is no, and which is a sad thing because, and, and the reason is, is that for some reason, and this, to be honest, is a little bit mysterious, even though we know j these pheromone traps are really effective tools for detecting and measuring populations when at the expanding population front, for some reason, the actual correlation between trap catch and actual local population density, it seems to fall apart once the populations become ex established over large areas. And I, I'm not really sure why that is. It may have something to do with dispersal of males, that it sort of mixes up the populations. But basically, the, the, there's been a lot of work that's gone into trying to use pheromone traps for monitoring populations in, in places like New York, where it's been established everywhere. And, and it, they just don't provide very useful information. And so instead, the, the standard method for monitoring populations um, in infested areas, such as like New York, Massachusetts, would be uh, via permanent uh, plots where you count egg masses. That is, you go to the back to these permanent plots and you count the number of egg masses, say, in a 40th acre plot. The problem is, is they're not very sensitive at low densities. You go into, if you have these plots, most years you will get zero egg masses, but that doesn't mean the population is extinct. It's just they're very low density. So, but they still will give you at least one year lead usually on whether the population is rising. In some states, I know Massachusetts does have a, a network of permanent plots where they they count egg masses, and and the idea is, is it provides you a little bit of an early warning so you can start to see populations rising um, before they reach defoliating levels. Um, um, let's see. Uh, is it important? To, oh, yeah. So, if gypsy moth outbreaks are not considered creating a negative impact on forestry, is the forest is spraying to protect forest recreation areas rather than marketable timber? Well, first, I wouldn't say it doesn't have any effect on timber. It's just that when you it, when you look at the ec the ec economics, the economic impacts on on residential land use. Um, is probably greater than the impacts on on forest impacts, and in fact, I mean, I've seen some studies say that the, the, the you know again the the impacts on timber they're not zero, um, and in fact they may in some cases justify uh, aerial suppression. However, I would hazard to guess in most situations they probably don't, um, and um, so so yeah, the answer is is that in most cases the aerial suppression is really targeted at um, um, places where people live. So most of the state, again, the, the Forest Service doesn't have such strict rules, but most of the states who actually carry out these programs um, do have. And I, I know, for example, that Pennsylvania will not allow you to participate in the cooperative suppression program if there's not a house uh, in an area. And in fact, there has to be at least one house for every, I can't remember the number, maybe every 10 acres in order to qualify. So in other words, so you can't get the cost sharing um, if, if there's not a house nearby. So uh, so let's see, the next question. So if, if we have traps to monitor populations, why don't we have traps to sell, why don't we have traps to sell commercially? <laughs> um, well, actually, they do sell traps. If, I know you go into area hardware stores, and you can go on the internet and buy pheromone traps. But again, the pheromone traps are not going to be useful. Well, A, one thing is pheromone traps are not useful for control at all. So mass trapping has been attempted. It's, it's very difficult to get 
mass trapping to work. And it definitely, it will, if it works, it would only work in these very isolated populations um, where uh, there are very low densities. Like, for example, I mentioned with the slow the spread program uses mating disruption. That only works at very low, low, low density populations. So in places like New York, Massachusetts, where tissue health has been established, mating disruption and mass trapping won't work at all. So um, let's see. Uh, what about the common practice of burning the tents or nests and trees? Ah, yes, this is one, something I should have pointed out. Gypsy moths do not make a tent in trees. They don't. They um, they make. They do produce silk, but they produce very. Um, you don't usually notice the silk produced. So normally, the, the when you see many times there's confusion between the gypsy moth with other insects like. Um, there's the uh, fall webworm and tent caterpillars. And um, they're, in fact, particularly the tent caterpillars, the larvae, look very similar to gypsy moths. They're, they're hairy, and they have colorful stripes and spots on them. Um, but they're a native insect. And usually, their outbreaks are much, they're not as extensive. And so it, tent caterpillar states in places like in um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, I believe parts of Michigan, you do have some pretty extensive outbreaks where there's some uh, uh, aerial suppression that's done, but in in the New England states and Central Atlantic areas, the the tent caterpillars and fall webworm, the damage I would say is usually negligible. I know the Allegheny Plateau, there have been a few outbreaks, and again in most areas there haven't been, the outbreaks are, are negligible. So, um, and even with fall webworms, if you have them in your property, I know there's this thing about burning the tents, but I always struck me as sort of a dangerous thing to do. I mean, you, I actually do that in my property. I'll go in and actually manually prune to remove the the uh, colonies. But but again, those aren't gypsy moths. But but it's uh, but some of that can be useful. Um, let's see. Are there studies on impacts from BT non-target LEPs? Yeah, that there have been. In fact, that's a really good point. That um, that that the BT does have some negative impacts on native Lepidoptera. And so as a result, very often, um, many areas you really can't use BT because if there's an endangered species of, of Lepidoptera. Of, and so that's it's a really important con concern. And I, one other thing I should point out is that there's another product called GypCheck, which is a, it's a formulation of the naturally occurring gypsy moth virus. Um, there's very limited quantities available. It's not available commercially, only the Forest Service. Forest Service makes about enough to treat somewhere around between 10,000 uh, 10, and 20,000 acres every year. And, but it's, the nice thing, it's very specific to the gypsy moth and doesn't have effects on non-targets. Peter, I noticed that we're actually at, at 1 o'clock or a little past. Uh, do we, can we keep yeah, going? Yeah, we or can. What's as, um, as long as you're available, we can, the, you know, the site is going to be open. Um, all afternoon, in theory, we could go. We could go okay. for hours if, <laughs> if you wanted. Um, <laughs> let's probably we go another yeah. five or ten minutes, and then we can uh, release people for their okay um, to get back to the rest of the sure. Day. Yeah. So Renee has a question yeah, about back um, Aaron um, Sprain in Orange County, New York. Yeah, I'm just reading. A local person was trying to recruit folks to chip in for aerial spraying in Orange County, New York. Good idea or bad? Well, again, it you know this is something because this is what happens with very often. Sometimes it's through the co-op suppression program in which it's usually done through, and again it varies with each state. I'm not absolutely sure in New York how it happens. Some I believe in New York does actually not participate. This is a state level decision. Well, state and lower decision. So it's new, last I heard, New York doesn't participate in the co-op suppression. So that means they're not getting any subsidy from the Forest Service. So instead, it would it would mean that in some municipalities or even sometimes private landowners will go out and contract with uh, uh, aerial operators. Um, the one thing I would urge a certain amount of caution, a certain amount of caution of having just individual landowners. Uh, contracting with private uh, applicators because um, th there's, you know, actually carrying out a aerial suppression program can be kind of tricky, and particularly if you're using BT, the timing has to be really perfect for it to work, or otherwise it's it's pointless. Um, so I would say it's better if you can get some government agency involved. Um, I mean, whether to do it or whether to treat or not, you know, if it's a 
if it's just a purely forested area, I suppose if it's a super high value oak resource, you know, say veneer trees, then there may be some value in it, just in terms of timber impacts. But probably most, most, most cases, probably the timber resources don't justify the aerial treatments. In a forested residential area, it really comes down to the homeowners, and uh, and very often, you know, for those of you who experience. It's not fun living in a gypsy moth outbreak because you know you have trees. Uh, you know you'll have total defoliation of trees, um, which can you know young trees very often can't tolerate defoliation. I mentioned before conifers as they get defoliated can completely die. So it's something that a lot of us you know I, I can definitely understand wanting wanting to treat, but if you do do it, I would suggest getting. Um, because aerial treatment, it's a tricky thing to do. Um, again, because of the timing and, and what material you use. Some of the aerial applicators are not necessarily knowledgeable, and there have been a few, hopefully, exceptions where there have been, you know, somewhat unethical operators taking people's money and not really, um, and basically treating in a way that's not likely to have an effect. Um, so I would try to do it something where the, the county or local municipality at least is involved. So let's see the next one. So the best method for control by individuals is either to scrape off egg masses in winter or to put the canvas wraps on trees and collect larvae. Um, well, again, it depends really what the situation. If this is just in your yard, um, and it really depends on how big your trees are. If you're if you're um, if your trees are small enough, um, you can, you know, say if they're less than say uh, 30 feet tall, you can even use a uh, one of these uh, 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 sprayers that hooks to your garden hose to get to the top of the canopy and apply a BT. Usually, you can go to your hardware store, and um, the BT is sold under the most common name is Thuricide. Or Dipel or Foray, and you'd have places. I, I've seen that. See, for some reason, places like Lowe's and Home Depot don't sell it. So you have to go to maybe more of a good garden shop, and they'll have it. Usually, and it's usually a material you mix uh, with water, or you you mount the thing directly with your garden hose. You can spray up into the canopy of a small tree. If it's a large tree, you're not going to get up in the canopy, and so then then you're either going to have to deal with either aerial spraying or Sometimes you can get uh, pest control companies will have one of these large hydraulic sprayers that will get up into the canopy of a, of a tree. But again, the timing is critical. And so for, again, if you're using BT, once the, you get past, say, the third third instar, it's not going to be effective. So essentially, once the caterpillars get to be larger than, say, a centimeter in, in length, you can forget about using BT. Um, you could use something like you know seven or or dimelin, um, but you know those are probably going to have bigger effects on on other organisms. So it's a, it's you know kind of decision you'd have to make. The scraping off egg masses and putting wrap band, you know bands on trees on the trunks is something that probably you'll find to be less effective. Um, and again, it, it'll be most effective if you do it on an isolated tree. Um, if it's a tree growing in, in a canopy with other trees, it's probably not likely to be effective at all. Um, our, so let's see, there's the last question. Are tent caterpillars and gypsy moths in competition for the same foliage? And does it mean anything? Well, it's an interesting thing. I mean, most the answer is yeah, yeah. In some cases, although uh, um, that um, in most areas, in say the mid-Atlantic states, they're usually not, the, the, the tent caterpillars are usually feeding on um, Black cherry is usually their most preferred species, and gypsy moth, it's not a preferred species for, for gypsy moth. So I'd say the mid-Atlantic area, they're not competing. When you get up into the northern areas, like up in, um, in northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, these areas, you do get in, in aspen and birch, you can get tent caterpillars and, and gypsy moths, and they're going to compete for the same um, foliage, which, and to be honest, we haven't really the gypsy moth is just now spreading into some of these areas for the first time, so we haven't been able to see what happens. 
I mean, from an ecological standpoint, it's kind of interesting to to think about uh, of what is going to happen because again, the the ten caterpillar outbreaks in these areas are somewhat cyclical. The gypsy moth outbreak should be too. So it'll be interesting to see how they interact. We don't really know. So, well, Peter, it's t one ten, and it looks like we got to the last question. So, uh, do you yes, want to end it here? Um, bring this to a close. Thank you very much, Sandy. This was a great presentation and um, you covered an enormous amount of ground and you did it very um, smoothly and gracefully and um, I appreciate uh, knowing more about gypsy moths, um, although I don't like them any better, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm more <laughs> informed about them. So um, with that, let me, um, I've put your email address so folks can can Good. click on that and uh, send you an email if they like um, and we'll uh, officially call this to a close and sandy i will see you um, back here i'll be on by 6 30 or 6 40 tonight and you can um, join sometime in that 6 30 to 6 45 6 50 window and and we'll have a, another go around of this at seven o'clock tonight Good. It's, I guess it'll be the happy hour yeah. version of Forest Connect. Right? I hadn't thought about it like that, but that's, that's a good marketing tool. <laughs> right. Right. So, and for those right. of Well, I'll just thanks. Yeah, I was just going to say thanks to everyone. I, it was very nice questions. And uh, If anyone wants to contact me, feel, feel free to send me an email. Okay. With that, I'll uh, officially close the webinar and wish everyone a good afternoon. Thank you all. Thanks.